The gravel road was warm on this sunny July afternoon as the woman eased her car along a curve. A figure caught her eye standing just along the roadway, and suddenly she heard the sound of static electricity as her car veered out of control. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. Today, we will be discussing the fascinating case of the Hulbert humanoid. This case occurred in July of 1977 near Hulbert, Michigan, um, a very small town located way up in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, or the UP, as people in the Midwest know it. A little before five o'clock in the afternoon, this woman known pseudonymously as Molly Smith was driving home to Hulbert along this desolate stretch of road and slowed down as she rounded a curve in the road. She was going about 15 miles per hour when halfway through the curve, she noticed someone standing alongside the road, um, right next to this kind of three foot tall embankment. She said that this figure stood about five feet tall and wore this one piece metallic dark green suit. However, she also noticed that it had large eyes, which were so big that they wrapped around the side of its head. As she came up right beside this strange person or being or figure, the witness claimed that her car slid out of control. She heard the sound of static electricity and just dropped the steering wheel. Now, what follows is, in my opinion, scarier than most of your average spaceman sightings. She said that her vehicle hit the embankment, slid, then was lifted into the air and came down harshly about 10 feet into the woods on the left-hand side of the road. But not just in the woods, literally landing on a four-foot-high pile of logs, which was surrounded on three sides by trees. She said that it came to such a sudden and abrupt halt that she bit her tongue. Mrs. Smith turned and looked behind her, trying to see if the strange being was still there, and, surprise, surprise, it was. She claimed that the being had moved and was now standing directly behind her car. However, she said that she really didn't feel afraid, just disoriented, um, except for the noise coming from her car. Apparently, the static hissing was still going on and she was afraid of that probably that the car was going to i don't know explode or do car stuff i don't know so she leaned her head forward on the steering wheel and began to pray thinking of her four children by the time she looked up the entity was gone she grabbed her purse jumped from the car and made a run for it sprinting the whole two and a half miles home she got her husband and a posse of about eight people to come help get the vehicle now when they got there oddly enough they found no skid marks and no disturbances on the nearby trees. They simply found her vehicle stuck on top of this four foot tall pile of logs, almost as though it had been lifted and placed there exactly like she described. They also noticed her footprints leading away from the scene and bizarre traces where she claimed the strange dark green metallic suited man was. The tracks resembled horse hooves, except with a heel and were dug deep into the hard packed gravel of the road. They led first from the woods to the spot where she saw the being, then back and forth behind her vehicle, and then back into the woods the way that they came. Now the car was so firmly stuck on top of this pile of logs that it couldn't be pulled down with any of the machinery um, that the people had brought. In fact, the two heavy equipment operators um, that they had called to get the car eventually had to cut the logs with a chainsaw and then drag the car off of them after they had literally cut away this pile of logs. One of them stated, that lady didn't get that car in those trees by herself unless she picked it up and put it there. After this grand adventure, the only damage to the vehicle was a very tiny scratch from one of the twigs. However, this was far from the extent of the phenomenon for Molly Smith and her family. For one thing, she noticed that the electric watch which she had been wearing during this encounter had stopped at 4.50, which was approximately the start time of her sighting, right when she spotted that weird figure by the side of the road. Then there were the lights. Mrs. Smith claimed that she and her family saw these anomalous lights in the skies around their home about three times in the fall of 1977. One of these times, it was actually her 15-year-old son who came to wake her to ask about this bright light that was hovering over a nearby pine tree. They said that the light was so bright that they actually watched it through their fingers for about 10 minutes until finally it dimmed out of sight. Now this is a really funky little case and honestly the whole article from the Grand Rapids Press by Dixie Franklin who went on to be inducted into the Michigan Journalism Hall of Fame as well as being the first woman chair of Michigan Outdoor Writers in addition to going on to write 
haunts of the Upper Great Lakes, the whole article is excellent reading and really shows that there was a lot of weirdness going on in northern Michigan, the UP, at the time. As Wisconsinite, I can say, when isn't there? Um, sorry, little Midwestern humor there. Um, in fact, anomalous lights were so numerous that several civilians started keeping logs, um, long-running notes about what they had seen, while also becoming very disillusioned with the official response. They would call the police, who would tell them to call the Air Force at Sault Ste. Marie, who would then tell them to call the police. Um, one scientist at Lake Superior State College actually informed one witness that what they were seeing was definitely Venus. The problem was the witness had pinpointed Venus in the west and was watching this other light maneuvering around in the east. So the strange lights were so commonplace that one witness claimed that when they got too close to his home, he would simply pull the drapes. You know, out of this flap, however, at least in the article um, that I mentioned above, um, this appears to be one of the only sightings of a bizarre humanoid being, especially a sighting so dramatic and traumatic. Now, it falls very neatly in line with many other roadside abominations. It especially calls to mind Wetzel's Riverside Encounter, where a man saw this um, thing covered in leaf-like scales standing at the side of the road in Riverside, California, and there was radio disturbance in this case. Now, it's really odd, but roadsides seem to be... Um, the kind of standard home for anomalies of any sorts, whether we're talking, you know, Bigfoot, man wolf, woman in white, just hitchhiking ghosts, will o' the wisps, dead brides, spook lights, bar guests, UFO occupants, whatever this thing was. Um, you know, we see so often that boundary places or liminal places, spots between or places of transition, seem to be just kind of the standby spot where these things manifest or show up. This case is also very interesting because of the tracks, those hoof but not exactly cloven prints if you get my drift. The tracks came out of the woods, appeared to pace behind the car a couple of times, and then went back. Now if you think about it, it's very odd to connect something such as a so-called UFO occupant, which again, this thing was never seen, as I have said so many times, to occupy a UFO. Um, with so many of these humanoid encounters, if it's not hair covered, doesn't look like Bigfoot or Mothman, um, doesn't fall neatly in line with, you know, what we would consider to be some sort of cryptid. It's just kind of given the stamp of, oh, well, it came from space. Um, again, I don't personally believe that these things do come from space as we understand it. I think they're all kind of connected and maybe some sort of um, near spectral but near physical manifestation. Um, but anyway, you know, it's really odd to think then there are so many of these encounters of these, again, so-called UFO occupants, which apparently then would come, as I said, from space, which actually come from the woods, which come from the wilderness. Um, and it's really interesting in this case that we see it standing at this boundary between the known and the unknown, um, the paved roadway and the wilderness, in fact, dragging the witness into this symbolic unknown by placing the vehicle in the wilderness. On dragging the witness's vehicle, um, which again, are we really sure that this thing did that? No, but it seems super highly coincidental that this woman saw this bizarre being standing by the road, the car completely left her control, and she ends up on this four-foot-tall pile of logs. Um, dang, do UFOs and other anomalies like disrupting travel? It's interesting because so many of these encounters can almost be seen as kind of a fill-in-the-blank. Um, this entire encounter reminds me of another great classic, the Marlinton encounter of Doc Priestley in which a man claimed that twice upon witnessing Bigfoot alongside a road, his car fried out and would not start. Now here, the car did not stop per se, but it left the control of the driver and eventually did come to an abrupt halt in a very dramatic way, by flying through the air and landing on this pile of logs. Now, although Molly claimed to hear a static noise, I often wonder if the concept of EMF disturbance in vehicle stoppages is kind of secondary to the initial trope, that simply of the vehicle stopping. Because if we go way back to the fairy faith, we'll see the same thing happening to people who are riding horses or going in carriages. Um, again, if we're looking at simple EMF disturbance, why would that stop a horse and carriage? I don't really know. However, here we also have kind of the flip side of this. Her electric watch stopped at the precise time that the experience started. Um, so again, with the paranormal, with the anomalous, it seems like you know, you might pin down one aspect and then something else almost completely kind of disregards that point. You know, if we look at this too and try and explain it away as someone going through a traumatic experience of having their car like, you know, veer out of control and somehow, some way, 
get that far off the road on top of this pile of logs. It's a little odd that the traces we have are for this bizarre being. She said that exactly where it was, exactly where it was standing and where it then walked, um, that was marked by these tracks. However, there is absolutely no trace of her car skidding out of control. There's no trace of her vehicle crashing, um, you know, over this embankment and then, you know, somehow going so fast that it flies up onto these logs without disrupting anything around them, without disrupting any of the trees. Um, I just find that very odd that, again, there's no trace of, you know, if this was simply an accident and somehow she manufactured this, you know, being to somehow be responsible for it, how is there no trace of that? And how, too, is the car completely undamaged except for, again, that one tiny scratch from a small branch? Yet again, too, we have the concept of perfect timing. I mean, how long was this thing just standing there waiting for someone to drive down this road and get spooked? Um, however, I think that the most interesting part of this case has got to be, um, you know, even over, again, the you know claim of the levitating car and even the entity, I believe that it is the recurring lights that the witness saw. There are numerous cases where sightings of strange beings, such as this case, um, or UFOs, or ghost encounters, or whatever, seemingly serve as the catalyst for continual sightings of anomalous lights. And this is truly a great example of that. As a matter of fact, in the Grand Rapids Press article about the case, regarding the strange lights, the witness is quoted as saying, it will happen again. Well, if you enjoyed this episode on the Halbert humanoid, please like, and if you're new to this field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with me on my free blog at patreon.com slash justanothertinfoilhat, and please tune in to the fantastic podcast, Somewhere in the Skies, um, for the best anomalous listening anywhere, as well as Just Another Tinfoil Hat audio episodes every other Friday. For today, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Do we?